Welcome to the Spiritual Artist Podcast. This is Chris Miller. I invite you to join me as I interview artists from a variety of disciplines. We'll share powerful stories and lessons learned while making their art. Good day. This is Chris Miller with the Spiritual Artist Podcast. I was just joking around with a good friend here who I am so excited to have on the podcast today. Um, Let me give you a little background of how I met John Domont. Um, I actually do the Urban Artist Market, as many of you know. It's a a live show with a diverse amount of disciplines in it. And John reached out, gosh, maybe a year or so ago, about his interest in being in the show. He asked for a Zoom call in order to meet me, which is a little unusual. Most of my people just talk to me on the phone. So I do this uh, Zoom call with John, and he immediately gets on the call, and I see this huge bookshelf behind him. And I want to tell you, for one thing, as you know, I'm a big reader and a writer. And so when I saw this bookshelf behind John with all these incredible titles, I almost found it hard to look at his face because I was so interested in reading the titles of all the many books. Most importantly, he was very similar to me. Some of the books were about spirituality. And some were about art and the craft of making and creating. And so I was, I was really thought, oh, this guy, I, I relate to this guy. This is someone that, that I really relate to. And so we started off there. And then, of course, John talked. <laughs> and he's a challenging, fun guy. And he's so interesting. I, I'm excited to have him on the show. So uh, the second thing that's really interesting about John is he is in the same primary discipline as I am. He is a painter a fine artist. And so I, I'm excited to have him on the show to share some of his techniques and some of how he approaches the craft of art. So um, I'm going to introduce him and we're just going to jump right in to a kind of a freewheeling conversation this morning. So good morning, John. How are you doing? Doing well. Thanks very much, Chris. Thanks for having me here. Yeah, I, I, I think we talked about that on our first call. I couldn't keep my eyes off your bookshelf and I tried to turn my head sideways and read the title. So it, it looks like you have been a, a great um, lover of intellectual stimulation all of your life. Is that so? Yeah, it's true. I've, I've always had questions. I've always had uh, the need to know and learn things. And um, some of those things are physical and some of those things are questionable, you know, non-material, so to speak. Of the spiritual realm, perhaps. Right? Yeah, so if you come up and visit like you're supposed to, then you can stand here and look at books yourself. I will I will get there, I promise you. I, I promise I'll get there. So I'm excited. To, we, we've had some conversations. John um, recently participated in one of my shows here in Dallas, and, and probably the highlight of the show for me was we went out to dinner on the first night of the show, and we sat in a restaurant with a couple other artists, and and we're talking about concepts of art and how you think through art, how you feel through art and all the different approaches that come into creating art. Uh, John, it looks like you I, you can always elaborate on this, but it looks like you have experience with with uh, painting, fine art, photography. Is that true? And writing, you said. Right. I've, I've pursued all three disciplines for most of my life. Um, I write poems. I've written essays. Um, I'm working on a book now, um, and I, I was in the dark room. I was on the bathroom floor with a light bulb and little tiny trays of chemicals when I was uh, 12 years old and uh, making my own photographic prints and continued that throughout my life. And then when I was in my early 30s, um, I started to paint. Well, I, I noticed on your bio, on your, I did go and look at your website for this call, John. <laughs> We've talked to each other many times, but I actually looked at your bio. And um, uh, you mentioned that you are always fascinated with light, with light. Right. Right. And, right. and um, in my book, I talk about uh, my fascination with light. And I, I actually, I find light and the noticing of light to be a real spiritual experience for me. It's, it grounds me. You know, and so I find that when I get up in the morning and I'm doing a morning meditation or my spiritual practice, I like to focus on like how the light is hitting the wall. Um, How how do you use light or talk talk to me a little bit about this fascination with light? Well, it's uh, different facets of the facets. 
you know, it's like a, a kaleidoscope, right? All those, or a bee's eye, you know, that has so many facets. And, um, and you can see into it or you can receive something from it. I mean, it, the door goes both ways, you know. And uh, there's an in and an out door, I guess. And um, a long time ago, I was on a bridge in Switzerland and uh, I'd been photographing and I turned around and, and, and I've also had a fascination with water. Water is like breath, is like life, is like blood. It's all the same flow in the, in the sense of now, in the sense of here. Um, time, of course, is an illusion and breath is real. So I was on this bridge in Switzerland and here comes the water from this mountain stream. And I was just at the right angle on this bridge above the water. It was really in the color, the color of the rocks. And yeah, I can't tell you what I had for breakfast yesterday, but that was, I don't know, 35 years ago. I can tell you the, what the color was, what the air temperature was. I have that kind of, you know, visual memory. And, uh, and I started photographing into the light hitting the water and hitting and hitting the rocks and began to see the movement of light, of light in the water droplets themselves. And, and that became, those photographs became painterly. And it wasn't long after that, that um, I went to Africa for the New York Zoo and did a job. And I was on a barge going up the White Nile and there were, the sun, sun was going down on the White Nile and there were all these colors of you know, in the in the wake and the waves behind the boat and started to photograph those abstractly. And so for a long time, I pursued photographing water. And, and then I came back from that trip and that's when I started to paint. But my pho photographs were abstract, uh, energy, light chasing, color chasing, uh, looking into the essence of the essence, looking for those those moments, those sparks, those compositions that revealed essence, that revealed as, as above, so below, the, um, the internal and the external are the same, the microcosm and the macrocosm. So that's what I was looking for. Those, mac those microcosmic revelations of light, color, and movement that reflected and abstracted the macrocosm. Wow. Well, you know, um, I, I always tell people that a spiritual artist, because in, in my book, The Spiritual Artist, I tell people that what I consider a spiritual artist is someone that is extremely conscious. And uh, when you describe that, how you're looking at the, the micro and the macro, it's obviously you're very, you were very conscious of the light on the water and how it re reacted to the water. I mean, it's it's about really seeing something, right? It's 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 seeing... A healthy human being has to see, hear, feel, and through that sense, sensing process, sensing um, experience, one can then understand. But in Western modern society, we've been taught and we are charged with seeing, skipping over the body process, understanding, and getting to a solution. And, and it's, a, it's a denial of the whole hum, human, humanity within each of us at a certain level. Now I know it's necessary. I mean, you, you want to teach a child four times four, you don't really want to know how he feels about it. You just want the child to learn four times four. And uh, it, as it is with any science technique or method, you know. Um, but for me, I want to see it. I want to hear it. I want to feel it because I want to experience it. I'm interested in the union. It's the same, it happens when I'm photographing water. It happens when I'm photographing anything where I be, can become lost and go away. And it happens when I paint and it happens when I write. I'm interested not in me, but, but in the merging, in the experience of knowing and living chewing on the viscera of the beauty of life in each living moment. Oh, I love it. No, I, I, I love it. Um, 
in so many ways. It leads me into so many questions. There's so many things we can talk about, but it, it, I, I love that when you talk about unification, right? Right. right. You, you, you know, um, unification. I like to do that. I ground myself before I go into the studio or right when I go into the studio. And I kind of do a meditation where I, um, I, 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 I'll focus on something and then I'll feel my connection to all that is, you know, and, and, and it's not just an intellectual, it's both, but it's both. It's realizing a connection to all that is because it is intellectual and it's about realizing that there is one, one power, one source behind everything, but it's also feeling for me, feeling my connection to all that is. Um, and, and it's undescri- I, I, I know you're a wordsmith yourself and it's almost undescribable, right? I mean, how, how do you put words behind that, that experience? Well, the, the experience for, for me is the primary, is the most important part of it all. And, and it, it, it's intellectual, it's emotional, it's sensory, it's um, transcendent, it's human, it's, you know, tasteless, odorless, and at the same time, it's got blood pounding through it, you know, and, and, and the breath, this breath, this living moment is what makes it real. Is, is what, you know, there's a myriad of philosophies and structures and methods that talk about whether this is all an illusion. Mm-hmm. I, I'm not willing in my, in my experience of life to have an intellectual assumption or um, conclusion uh, that would box or encapsulate my steps in life. I, I wanna, I wanna know it. I mean, Turner used to uh, have himself strapped. God, he was such a great painter. He used to have himself strapped to the front um, mast. Uh, uh, of a fishing boat or whatever kind of boat he would go out on, and he, he say he would say, "I don't care how bad the storm is, don't untie me." And he, he wanted to know it and feel it before he could paint it because he didn't want to he didn't want to falsify it. You know, the Kimball. I don't know if it's still at the Kimball, but there's a great at the Kimball. I think still right now there's a great Turner exhibit uh, in Fort Worth, and people should run over there and see that for sure. Um, he was he was. Uh, Many, many great painters are mystics of the moment. They're, they're, I don't know if they're mystics or sensualists or, or wounded children lo- looking for, for the peace of life. Uh, it could be all, it could be a, com- and, and there are more answers to that too. It could be a combination, who knows, but. Yeah, I love, I love sitting here seeing you um, work with it because it is a struggle. Right. It's a struggle to put any one word around it. Um, and, and so many words fit in it, as you said, you know, all of the above, some of all of the above or both and or both. Um, and so it's that feelingness, uh, which, you know, that's one of I'm glad you brought that in, because that's something that I wanted to talk to you about, because um, uh, my book is my my book is really focused on the intellectual argument. And and I kind of I realized just a couple months ago that I've really ignored the emotional uh, discussion of the experience. And I'm actually working on some chapters. And my last interview was with Terry Martin, and he talked about his emotional process. And I hear you talking about that, that feelingness. Um, so can you, can you tell our listeners, like, you know, one way that you work with that when you approach the uh, studio, how, how do you, how do you, as Terry said, it's like surfing, you know, surfing a wave or following the wave or um, how, how would you describe using feelings and emotion in, in the studio itself or before the studio? I don't know. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that one time, one, how do you really feel? One time I made a, I broke up with a, a lady friend and I went to the studio and I pounded out this painting of my heart. It's, I still have it. It's thick and it's big and juicy and full of blood and pain. And, but, but uh, 
that's the only time I think where I have consciously used my pain, my emotion, my feelings in my art. I am much more interested for me and what I'm saying and what I care about is what's interesting, which is life, which is what, what um, I was in art school and I saw um, this great documentary, a man with a movie camera or a day in the life of, I don't, Lenin, I don't remember the actual title, but it's a guy in Leningrad and it's 1915 or something. And he's running around and there's the butcher cutting meat and there are people getting on and off the subway and, or the streetcar and all these facets and aspects of daily human life. And so that taught me more than anything what art is, that which reflects humanity, that which reflects our experience, that which in, in embraces all of us. And so from, from that point of view, I have chased that kind of experience, those kinds of images, that kind of language. That's what I care about. That's what I want to say. I want to talk about who we are, where we are, what we share in common. What's, um, I get a lot of great joy when I do my work or I'm in nature or uh, whatever I'm doing that, that, that is experiential or growing for me. The joy comes from expressing, comes from being in dialogue with the silent unknown. That, that for me is my safe place. That for me is, is the office. That's where I go. And I, I don't want me in the way. I want me out of the way so that like that creek river I was photographing in Switzerland, it can flow into me and through me and I can have the transcendental human experience of being there, seeing it, feeling it, tasting it. And I want to share that kind of because life is such a mysterious, amazing gift. And we also as artists, uh, if there was one emotion maybe that I bring to my work, perhaps it's sadness. And the sadness of the abuse of the world, the sadness of the abuse of each other, the sadness of. But I think everybody in their own way finds a way to see the glory, the beauty, the joy, the harmony in life. We just seem not to be able to do it together too much. And that's, that's for me, painful. That's the river of tears. And so I think if there's an emotion that I carry into the studio, I mean, I don't sit and try and cry and go into the studio in pain. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a constant in my, in my heart, I think, you know, or in my life. So, okay. Wow. You said, I, 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 if this was a tape and I could stop you and then comment and then play a little more and stop it and comment. So uh, a couple different things you brought up here. One is being, you know, I, I, I originally you were talking about being the watcher, you know, like Eckhart Tolle says, watching, and, and when you talk about recording the life around you and the beauty of life and watching those, the, the, the light hitting those waves and, and, and kind of what I heard you say, and please correct me if I'm wrong, kind of stepping back yourself, quieting yourself so that you could truly receive it. Right. right. It's, it's uh, the ego and the self, the, the unification of heart and mind. There's, Lots of ways to talk about it. And I was always confused. I mean, it started as a teenager. Am I supposed to fulfill my ego? Am I supposed to spiritually put my ego aside? How do I find peace in this lifetime with, with all that I am? And so I made up this story about, about Pierre, the, the French-Canadian uh, log roller guy. And have I ever told you this story? No, you haven't. This is a new one. You want to hear this? <laughs> yes, I do. Of course I do. Okay. So there's, so there's this guy, Pierre, and he's got the wool socks up to his knees and spiky boots. And he's got on a, a black and red checkered shirt. And, you know, his knitted hat is cocked to one side. And he's got a beard. He's got the pole for moving the logs down the river. That's his job. He moves the logs, you know, down the river. He's a true, true lumberjack woodsman guy. And he's got to know the, the, 
temperature of the water, the viscosity of the, the water in the log, the speed of the wind, the direction of the wind, you know, lots of things. It's got to be in touch with all the technical left brain mm. male, not man, but male aspects of the energies present. And he does. He pays attention and he's the best. But when he stands up and he goes, hey, I am Pierre. I am the greatest log roller. Boom. He's in the drink because he at that moment, it became so much about him. That he gave up being in touch with being in touch and missed a step or the log rolled and he got wet. So, yeah, we take joy in our accomplishments. We take pride in our accomplishments. But we're a part of something. It's not us. We're not separate. You know, we're in, involved, included. We are in a natural state of unification. And I think maybe my art and my journey and my, I'm a one note guy. Maybe I say the same thing all the time. But, you know, we, we live uh, in heaven on earth. Will, will, we, will we really ever understand the greater energies and cosmic forces behind us all? Maybe when we transition to the next lifetime, I don't know. But, but the joy of heaven on earth is the human experience. And, and that's good enough, you know? I mean, how many cave guys stood up on the ledge, you know, with thunder and lightning in the distance and they're standing there with their spear and they go, yeah, this is cool. This is cool. You know, I mean, we all have battles. We all get chased by the saber tooth tiger. We all get, you know, run over by stampeding, you know, woolly mammoths or whatever. But at the same time, there are moments and there are opportunities where we find safety. I always thought, I always thought that the 60s were sort of a little bit askew in that we, we had as a goal peace. Everybody wants peace. Everybody wants to feel peace, but peace is an abstract concept. I don't know how you make that. If you make a safe society, truly safe, that embraces and empowers everybody, children, women, all minorities, ethnicities, everybody. I think minorities is a word that ought to be lost. Then, then um, and you make it safe for everybody, then peace, comes out of that of course the the threat to that is that power would abuse control in the name of safety do you think i mean because isn't it by being unsafe in a way that isn't that the edge of creativity you know we you talk about tying yourself to the mast and and, mm -hmm. and on the wave is is it is creativity safe or is it well, Whatever, whatever you have to do to go out and get yourself out of the way and experience life all around you, uh, like a, a kayaker, right? Those guys are like wild and brave. They're in there in their little pointy boat and, and they're going over waterfalls and they're going around rocks and they're going, you know, some really dangerous uh, surf that they go through. And the guy can't have that predetermined. He's got to get out of the way, pay attention and see how that, he may have shot that same rapid yesterday or last week, but today the water flow is different and he's got to pay attention to how to get through that rapid. Do I go left? Do I go middle? Do I go right? And so life is, this moment is not the same as the last moment. It's a constantly evolving and it comes with breath. You know, all we can do is surf, is surf the breath and surf what appears to be moments strung together. Moments are an illusion kind of like time is. There's, there's, there's livingness, livingness, life. Uh, we live in a unified state. We're not separate. And I think that's what I'm trying to wake up to and express. So do you think that's the theme behind most of your paintings, is that connection to all that is? I, I, I hope it is. I was going to say, that's why I sign my paintings on the back. I'm trying to give everybody a window of experience so that it's like, remember this, folks? Ding. And, and there's like this possibility of experience there. 
And so I sign my paintings on the back because I don't want the two dimensionality of my name to get in the way of the multi-dimensionality experience I'm trying to express. Well, it's I, I, once again, an, a commonality between us because I've never wanted to put my name on for the same reason. I feel like this painting isn't about my name. Yeah. This is not about my ego or look what I can do. Look what I can do. Here's my signature. You know, and people say, why is your name? I'm like, it's on the back. Because I, I claim it. I'm not saying I, I don't claim my creativity, but I don't, that is my name in me is not the creativity. And so I, I love how you just described that. And um, I was going to tell my listeners to check out your work because it's it's very exciting. And, and um, there's a what I like about it is I'm an I'm an abstract painter. I I, I love the abstraction, um, and yet, and I see you have a, a background in drawing and literal literativeness, and yet your your work is not it is not literal. Uh, it's it's a really interesting way of combining abstract with real reality um and there's a there's this fanci fanciful i don't know if that's a word but there's this fancifulness where um i love the the image you know where where a boy might be looking over a cliff and the boy is very clear it's very literal i see it, it's it's a young boy or young man but what he sees is abstracted in 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 sort of like a color blocking uh style and the colors are pop it and they're and they're wonderfully placed in their conflict between where they're placed and the angle and the three-dimensionality of it so you really have done a wonderful job of bringing those two aspects together and 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 for me um when i see that painting i just go oh. you know i like i, I look at it go oh wow look because it, it's what life is it's like we are human we're tied to this humanness and then we look out there and there is all this magic, and as you said, unnameable, undefinable, unknown. And to me, that's what what that's what the color blocking represents. Now, I'll, I'll let you talk about that a little bit. What I, I don't know the name of that painting. Um, do you know which one I'm referencing when I say that? Well, there are a few that go that way. But first, let me just say thanks. You're you're such a joyous, enthusiastic, sincere guy, man. I mean, it's just a pleasure to watch you talk, and thank you for your embracing and appreciation of my work you know wow. very very kind of you and and brothers in arms thanks so much chris oh well, you're welcome I, I, likewise <laughs> I, 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 so so I, I you do have several paintings in that genre and i i really resonate with it you know you have found a way to merge the two for me I, 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 yeah thanks i've always sort of seen myself standing on a bridge between the two worlds right and, and there aren't two worlds. There's only one world. It's unified. We're a part of it. But it's like the seen and the unseen, the known and the felt, the, the, the present and the coming into being. You know, a, a mountain might look like this today. It might have a rock slide tonight and look like something else tomorrow. Uh, it's, it's all shifting, ever changing, ever coming into being, ever, ever going away, ever morphing. And um, so I'm trying to paint that experience of unification is what I'm trying to paint. Um, Einstein, you know, at 19 did, did the great theorem, you know, of relativity and then spent the rest of his life working on the theory of, rel of, of unification and didn't feel that he'd succeeded at it or didn't succeed at it. And, and for me, it's just the experience of every day I want, I want, I want to, feel all that I feel, see all that I see. That's why we all love to travel. We get to see something new. We get to have life touches us in a bigger, broader, different way when we travel. And um, Mie, you know, uh, um, Van Gogh called him the father, right? Uh, the père. And, and Theo, Vincent's brother, brought him um, copies, prints, of uh, Jean-Francois Millet, uh, French painter, after the academic period in the 1800s, brought prints of his to, to Vincent in the asylum, and Vincent would copy those paintings and called and called Millet uh, Le Père, the father. And, and so we see Millet coming into uh, the art world right after the academic painters and that are used to getting commissions from uh, nobles and wealthy, you know, and people in power and so on. 
And V8 paints a snail at the base of a daff daffodil. We've gone from heaven in the church ceiling and, and noblemen in fine clothes to people wearing clogs, planting seeds in the field, and a, and a snail at the base of a daffodil. How more beautiful, how more real do we need to get than that, you know? Oh, lovely. <laughs> yeah. He's a very cool guy. Yeah. Well, I was going to tell you, um, stepping back to, to that painting that I refer to in several of your paintings where you have a, 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 a melding of literal and, and what we could describe as the unknown, the spiritual. Um, I, I had completed a course in a spiritual training course. And one of the principles that we focus on is that spirit is the, comes before matter, the spiritual, the idea of something, the spiritual essence is more pure before the manifestation, because there's this, when ideas arrive, when you paint, it's coming from somewhere. And and it's a place where um, that is not defined by boundaries or humanness. And so when, when I would do coaching with people and someone would say, um, I'm unhappy about blah, 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 I always try to get them to focus on the spiritual essence of it. What is the spiritual truth behind this? So if someone says, um, I lost my job, I might say, well, what is the spiritual truth? And, and that you are valuable no matter what. You're always valuable. That, that's just a job. That's just one job. The spiritual truth of who you are is that you are an eternal creature, an eternal expression of God, an individualized expression of God. So even though your body may change and your job may change, you are eternal. And so I love that because you're really kind of playing with that in, in your work. You know, you're, you're playing with that. I want people to see this. I want them to, to recognize the spiritual realm as well as the physical, you know, and, uh, and it is, a, it's a delightful place to be. And then when you talk about the snail and the bringing it down, it's about that consciousness of truly seeing what is. Exactly. So well said, man. Beautiful. Yeah. That's great. That was great. And, 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 and exactly. And I, and I love that too, because I encourage, uh, painters, artists, and I think this is what artists excel at. They excel at seeing, seeing what, what's there. And in your case, maybe seeing what's not there yet or, or seeing what could be or seeing what has yet to come. Um, so I think that all, with, with the listeners, I say that's, that's a wonderful challenge is to really look at something. And so I encourage people when they're painting, um, I remember my mentor, my, my painting mentor in, in Santa Fe, she would say there's two kinds of painters. There's one painter that's just falls in love with what they're painting. I want to paint barns. I'm painting barns. I'm painting barns. And then the other kind of painter, they fall in love with the paint. And she's talking from, they just, the way it spreads, the way it fuses colors together. What does it do on this texture as opposed to what it does on that texture? And they literally fall in love with what can paint do? What, and what can paint with alcohol sprayed in it or on a different, you know, there's so many ramifications of that. Um, and, and so I, I think that I encourage people when they sit down, like you said, to, to, to think about, are you falling in love with the subject and what you want to say, or are you falling in love with the material itself? And, and there's no right or wrong, right? Well, well they're, they're different and, and they're, they're completely um, sort of diff different levels of the same story. I mean, technique, methods, and materials, and how they poetically unflow, you know, unfold with when alcohol is sprayed in them or whatever that's certainly an interesting uh, journey of learning methods, materials, and, and process and harks back to the 50s when it was, you know, all about technique, process, method, materials, uh, Marshall McLuhan, the, the medium is the message, and, and so on and so forth. And then, and then there are people who will have terrible technique can be slobs in their studio or put the paint on, you know, squeeze the paint out of, I've seen this, I've seen this, this woman was so creative and she would just stand and look at the easel and squeeze the, 
paint out of a tube onto her finger and then just draw it onto the canvas. And she was so visceral with the process as, as you, you know, alluded to there. And that brings up a whole nother subject, which I don't know if we have time for today, which is about uh, the, the, the right brain, the feminine receptive, which is so important to, I mean, the guy who's spraying alcohol on his painting, on, on his paint, maybe that is the entrance into the river of the unknown for him. And there are some people who deeply already experience that. And there are mystics who go chase that. And at the same time, it's not taught in school. You know, school is taught is, is method materials, and it's really not about receptivity and poetic uh, uh, receptivity or, or the unknown feminine as the, as the rules of the male technique and methods are known. And so that's a whole nother level of learning. And, and one is about going after things and learning it. And the other one is learning how to not go after it and how to receive and how to allow. And if you can't listen and you can't feel and you can't hear or you don't allow yourself that you're you're cutting off half of your life and at the same time if you are interested in being an artist that's that that's the world that you have to be to tie yourself to the mast and go out in the storm oh man i just love what you said there uh okay so the two sides being, and I'll repeat it and then you can correct me, but the two sides being one is more the technical aspects, but the other where you said was just about the, the listening, right? And just receiving. And, and I, I, I think I am drawn to that, that side. Um, uh, you know, you, we both know Melanie Brennan and she is a golden uh, rep. And, she, and when I was just in the studio with her a couple of weeks ago and and she can't help herself, right? She's she's always like handing me these new new products. Oh, you got to try this and try this gold stuff and try this. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Just give me one thing. You know, I just just give me one thing, and I could play with metallic gold for weeks. <laughs> you know what I mean? Metallic gold is a lot of fun. Sure. It is a lot and of fun. Me, me, you're, I think I'm probably older than you, but when we were kids. You know, I was a Crayola kid. I'd get a box of six crayons, and then the next year it was 12. And then that was the only part of school I looked forward to each fall. It was like 24, and then 64, and then I think the 128s, there, there were the metallics. And it was like, son of a gun, look at these. And it was like a whole new world, you know? I know. I could play. And, and so she's like, she came up to me when we were painting, and she put a new tube or something. And I said, no, 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 I can't add that now. I'm I'm halfway through this. And uh, and and because to me, it's about you know, you can literally, and I encourage any artist to do this to to sometimes just minimalize your your suite of tools. Just minimalize it. Just use black ink and a straw, and 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 have at it. And, and don't get caught up on all the different, the 200, what is it, 248 shades of color, because that's a whole road too. And, and then on the other hand, keep you, another challenge would be to just keep trying every color. You, take a painting and throw every color you think of in there. <laughs> you know, just keep going, right? So, so many ways to, to explore creativity. And, um, and, but learning to be receptive, like you said, and listening, one one thing can get you there just one one tool right yeah right you you you, ne you never know i mean it's it's like pr pursuing the the unity of your your own being and pursuing the unity of the art experience it's the same journey and and for me one feeds the other and i've always sort of thought it was like looking for the pearl you know how the dragon in an Asian um, um, culture has a pearl in its hand, and the pearl represents essence, that represents your soul. And, and so for me, the journey is to, to get there and, and unify with myself through self-knowledge, through self-action, through, through you know, good acts of service, and at the same time fulfilling, was I always an artist? I grew up with a guy who became the governor of Indiana and he always got Mitch Daniels. What a sweetheart of a guy. And he always got straight A's. And we always said, Mitch, you're going to grow up and be the president. Well, he's, you know, a, a unified governor, both the Republicans and the Democrats in Indiana. Love this guy. And he was great. He's now the president of Purdue University. And he always got straight A's. And he always said, you're going to be the president. I was always looking out the window, drawing clouds. 
you, you got to fulfill who and what you are and you didn't create yourself, but you are an essence of creation that needs to be fulfilled. And so I always thought it was like going into a coal mine, looking for that pearl. And, and you, you have maybe a, a lantern in your hand if you're lucky. And to try and find that pearl in the dark of oneself. And so that means opening, trusting, listening, using your intuition and your imagination, as well as the tools of technique and methods that you've learned along the way to help you make your steps. So both the masculine and the feminine or male yin yang. Um, right. ba balance, balance. So balance. So do you, kind of a boring question in a way, but do you pre-plan your paintings or do you just sit down and start and let it happen? Well, well, it's both. I mean, in, inspiration, sometimes you just feel like going in. When I draw, uh, sometimes I just start with a doodle and let it grow into something. And, and oftentimes that'll grow into a painting or, or an imaginative piece. An imaginative piece is different than an inspired piece. I've done the whole series of begging bowl paintings. I'm on number 90 now. The teacher back in the 80s read me a, an old Chinese script, a Taoist script that said, come before the divine with a bowl, an empty bowl, a beggar's bowl. Knock me out of my chair. We're all beggars. Well, I want this. I need that. We're constantly in, in, in prayer to, to the unknown universe, but we don't get conscious about it. We don't say, you know, we don't, we don't hear it hear and feel what we're saying too much so that we become conscious and really and really embrace and empower who and what we are in that living moment, which is sort of what my book's about. So did you fall an idea when you paint that? You said 99? Or 99? Not, not, I'm on number I'm on ni number 90 now. And and so what happened was three months after he read me that script, at 2 a.m. this flaming red bowl in the middle of my mind, woke me up and I went to the studio and I painted this thing and I went back a couple of days later and I finished and I thought, well, that's begging bowl number. It's a big, I didn't, wasn't number one. It's, that's a begging bowl. Well, they continue to show up in meditation, in reverie, just staring at the floor. And I, and I, sometimes I go two years and I never see one. And then all of a sudden one will come to me. In the journey of 90, I made up three of them and they, they were, they sucked. They were terrible paintings. But an inspired painting is a living image. We're all connected to the universe, to, to ourselves, to life, in the grandest possible ways of, of physics, of energy, of um, mentality, of spirituality, of unknown electricity coming to us and through us. And an inspired or living image is something different than an imaginative image. You see a lot of constructed pieces in art these days, interesting use of materials, but nothing transcendental, nothing that hooks up to more than sort of narcissistic surrealism. If, if for me, it's art has got to go beyond just me. It's got to hook up and be of value or inclusive to others and all and the universe for it to have a certain level of interest and validity for me. Um, and so the Begging Bowl series is virtually, except for the three, an inspired series. And that's different than an imaginative crea creation. And both are valid levels of art. And, and one feeds the other. You know, what if I see the bowl and I put it on the left side of the canvas? Or no, what if I put it on the right side? And that's intuition and imagination and technique and methods and materials. But for me, the main experience, the thing I'm after and want the most and, and try to live, my, I live a fairly secluded life so that if there's something I need to hear, I can hear it. So if there's something I need to see, I can see it. And, and sometimes that's a begging bowl. And sometimes it's just, like Vincent said, you go to work every day like a cobbler making shoes. And some days magic happens and you don't know why. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, a quick question. Since you said you have 90 of those, have you had an exhibit with 
with just those? I've had a few a few exhibits. Uh, when I had my gallery back in Indiana, I think I had one or two begging bowl exhibits, but no, I, I haven't, you know, I haven't. And marketing myself and um, having shows and writing all the letters, I, I'm a little uh, not so good at that. Well, I think that'd be really powerful to have 20 different paintings from that series. Oh, I, I would love, I would love to do that. that do you, do you still fun. have a lot of them or have you sold most of them? I've or? sold, I've sold, I've sold quite a few of them. And I was, they were heavily collected and I was known for them back in the Midwest. Um, but I still have a number of major ones. And um, like I said, I'm still producing when they come. Huh. Uh, very, very cool. So I think I remember us talking about this a while back um, after I interviewed a, a, a guy that does uh, drawing in dreams. I don't know if you remember that. And he, he talked about, and I was talking to you about icons or things that come up in your work, repetitive icons um, or symbols. And you brought up the bowl. And I think you brought up a dove or something, a bird. Yeah, a, do a dove is also a symbol of, you know, breath, holiness, life. Yeah, because I, I know that my artist, uh, my friend that was an artist in um, Santa Fe, she had a bird image that would come up, my mentor. And I know other people um, that uh, there's a guy in Santa Fe also that does a crow, a series of crows. And, and that image represents something for him. You know, um, that's important. I I, yeah, I, I'm sorry, I'm going to interrupt you here. It's yeah. important to, ha to have those 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 companions in your work. But for me, it's more important that my work become poetic and readable rather than personal in its reflection. I don't want to just be, be drawing painting for my story about me. I want that story to be transcendent. I want that story to be translatable. Something that other people will relate to, or just something right. Can, can, can see the, can see the poetry of, and although it's not literal, get, get the, get the content get the feeling, get the, the essence of the meaning through it. You know, there's no guarantee in art that anybody's going to see what you painted and, you know, take it on the way. But, but you can try and be. Clear. I think, I, I think every artist has stories where people walk up, you're at your own show and someone <laughs> walks up and you, and they don't know who you are. Right. You're right. And they start talking about your work and you're like, Oh my God. But you know, <laughs> And the things that people see in it, or we all have the story where someone comes up and goes, that, that's an elephant right there, isn't it? And you're like, no, that was my aunt. But, you know, it, it, it happens to, to everybody. Um, I, I, will, I will share that with my it listeners. It takes, takes you down a peg and puts you on the earth is what it does. It that's does. A quick, it's a quick dose of humility. It's stepping back from your ego, that's for sure. Right. Yeah. And, 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 and I have the reason I love abstract is I'm trying, I feel like I'm trying to create a language in, sh in shapes and color without any sort of coming from within. So, so my, I'm painting from within, which is, with, which is just light shape and color, not in my mind from without, like, you know, you go and you see a beautiful woman and you paint that beautiful woman, you're outwardly directed. You're looking outside of yourself and you're painting something. And so I've, for me, I've always just loved abstracts because I find them particularly challenging because they're just coming from a, from whatever you want to call it, an intellectual, emotional wavelength that's coming through me. Um, I'm waiting. I keep waiting for something literal to, to grab me, something iconic that would grab me. Um, and for I instance, don't know. I don't know. For instance, the painting behind you, did you intentionally put that figure in? <laughs> What figure? No, I don't. I mean, I just know it was. A, it was Chris. There's a figure right there, and and I mean, she's beautiful. If there's a figure in that painting, it is totally organic. It totally came out. I I I start with line and shape, and can we bet um, lunch on this or something? <laughs> sure, sure. I win. <laughs> no, I win. no. I'll sh I'll show it to you when that when we're done talking. Next time we're together. Yeah. No, no, no. So, I'll show it to you when we're done talking. Today. So I'm just, I was just saying that, you know, and I think that's okay. Obviously I, I appreciate someone. I see people that can, I've seen people with pastels do the most in, in, incredible drawings and it's just not, it's not engaged me. And I don't know why as for me, it is not, it doesn't engage me as something I want to do. I appreciate it. I always appreciate it, but not something I want to do. And I think as an artist, we all find our language. You know, what, what is it? You know, 
and going back to what I said about your work, you really have kind of taken those two in my mind, that that literal and that ethereal, that spiritual essence and kind of merged them, which is which is cool. That's a, that's a lovely comment. That's what I try to do. I appreciate the compliment. And uh, I, I hope that with some humility, I'm getting somewhere near that. And I want to continue because I think, I mean, I've pursued being able to make a language. And so if you make a language, then you have a, a, a way to voice something that you feel you want to, you know, and then, Finding you're, your, an, then you're standing up being an artist. Yeah. Finding your language. You know, I want to go back to something you said way back in the beginning of this interview. Um, you talked about how you broke up with someone and you used that, you kind of walked with that feeling um, and it came out. And uh, I did a painting once where I was very angry and I literally, I was so emotional with that poor canvas. I poked a hole through it. <laughs> I literally ripped the hole through with my paintbrush, which now is why I paint on wood mostly. But, <laughs> but so so then you talked about stepping back and kind of kind of diffusing who you are and getting out of the way. That sounds like that's your language more, getting out of I the think, way. I think that's right. Cezanne used to cut up his paintings with his palette knife and throw them out the window, and they'd be hanging in the tree outside of his studio window. So you know. <laughs> You're in a good club if you poked a hole in your can. Oh yeah, I tore right through the dang thing, you know. And so, so not not much. So mostly, when you enter the creative process, you are quieting your mind, quieting your emotions, and listening. It's it's for me. It's service. okay. Flat out, it's service from my heart. I'm trying to let my heart give love, feel love be loved and love, you know, universally as well. Huh. I love that. I, uh, I'm going back to my most recent interview with Terry and he talks about acting and see in their, in their arena, uh, sometimes acting means carrying negative emotion, you know, like anger or portraying sadness yeah. or anger or hate. And uh, there's no wrong, as we know. Some people go either well, way. Right. Well, I mean, uh, emotions for an actor are a paintbrush. I've got a paintbrush and color that I can use. They, they are the paintbrush and they are the color. So they've got to create from within, from, from their expression, you know. Yeah. It's very challenging. It, yeah. it is challenging. So, um, all right. Well, I wanted to... to uh, bring up one other thing with you because we're we're getting near the end here unless there let me ask you is there anything else you wanted to, you would like to share about your process no i don't think so <laughs> just if there's a college around that wants me as a teacher i would like <laughs> to teach. Oh, well, well, i'm sure they're they'll be calling you right away um uh, well whatever. Uh, what, one of the things I loved and I knew that, that I wanted to do this podcast is uh, John took one of my, I had a class about my book in last summer and, and it was such a great, it was so great to have you in on there in that class because you brought an energy to that room that, you know, I, I talk, a lot of artists aren't comfortable. I assumed that every artist was comfortable talking about spirituality, but that's not really the case. And, and there are many artists that, like you said, are really, really working with that, um, male energy, the technical aspect, but not the emotional or, or even balancing back and forth. Um, so I really enjoyed having you in that class. And I am te I wanted to tell the listeners that I am teaching another class this January through the Creative Arts Center. And it's on um, January 13th, 20th, and 27th, and it's online. And that's the neat thing, John, I didn't have to drive you up, drive up to have the class in Wichita Falls, but anybody can sign up for this class from anywhere in the country because it's online through Zoom. But um, John kept me on my toes. I'm sure the listeners could tell. <laughs> uh, I, I just would encourage the listeners to, uh, if they have any inclination in this direction at all, to jump on the bandwagon and take your class and buy your book and read your book and pay attention to the, not only the things that you're saying, but the questions that you ask. So you're interested in exploration, not just definition, and that's pretty interesting. Thanks. Yeah, I, I, uh, and I, and likewise, and I said it earlier. Uh, check out your paintings and your work. Um, there's a lot of different things to to learn from it, and uh, and about 
that careful balancing between between both states, you know. Cool. Cool. Great. Hey, well, it was a pl pleasure being with you and uh hope I gave you something of, you know. Oh, you, you did. But, well, I, I I really I love that and I I share that I will repeat that again with with the listeners is I love the idea of getting your ego out of the way. And so in my book, I talk about quieting your thoughts and I talk about uh, resisting the temptation. We get so grabbed up in our lives. You know, something happens to us and we let it pull us from center. We let it pull us from center. And the key here, the key for me every day is to practice getting back in center, getting back in center, you know, all day long, something, someone cuts me off in traffic, ah, ah, get back in center. And, and for me, that center is, as you described, that where you're just noticing the light hitting the water and noticing the beauty of all that is and noticing that you are part of all that is. That's my center. And, and that's what my practice is. It's painting with that center in mind, you know. Beautiful. Well, well said. Lovely. So, well, we will go have. Go ahead. I said, I'm, I want to go there. That sounded great. All right. Well, thanks again. And um, I will, I look forward to, uh, obviously, you know, we're going to be doing more painting together and all that, but uh, I'm glad to have you on the show. It's been my pleasure. Uh, I, I like talking to you. You're a lot of fun and a joyous character are you. <laughs> thanks a lot. Thank you for listening to the Spiritual Artist Podcast. Whether you're following the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or Google Podcasts, Make sure you choose the subscribe button so you'll receive new segments when they're released. Plus, check out my new book, The Spiritual Artist, now available on Amazon.com. In the meantime, be still, listen, and know that you are a spiritual artist.